The Earth, Lecture 1. I have a series of five lectures or presentations having to do with the Earth. Before I start reading quotes, I think it's important that I just outline in a couple of sentences or so uh, the fact that the earth is alive. It has a spirit. It has intelligence. And we'll re I can't remember which quote it is, but uh, one of the uh, authors of the near-death experience says that the earth is a mighty being. The earth is um, fulfilling the measure of its creation in providing a place where spirits can gain physical bodies and be tried and tested through their mortal lives. And so in summary, we'll find out through these quotes that the earth and Heavenly Father, God, are partners in bringing to pass the eternal life of mankind. My first uh, two quotes come from I Saw Heaven by Lawrence Tooley. And I'm reading the first one from page 58. I felt whole and complete and more fully alive than at any time I can ever remember. When I turned and looked back at the earth, I was surprised to find it was so far away. I was seeing it from, from a great distance. It looked like a small, dirty, brown ball. No bigger than a tennis ball. I felt a certain revulsion from the sight and was relieved and glad to be away from it. Now several authors are going, or experiencers, are going to talk about the earth being dirty, uh, dark, gray, and that is not talking necessarily about pollution, but about moral, spiritual pollution. Uh, sin darkens the earth. The more sin, the darker it gets. And since it is a living spirit fulfilling the measure of its creation, it has feelings about things that are happening on the surface of the earth, um, things that are, we would call sin by mankind. Okay, second quote, page 71. Everything on the earth and in heaven go hand in hand. Everything that exists on the earth was created in heaven first. Likewise, whatsoever shall be sealed on the earth shall be sealed in heaven, and whatsoever is loosed in heaven shall be loosed on the earth. That comes from Matthew in the New Testament. Next quote, Beyond the Veil by Lee Nelson, and we get this insight. From a certain point of vantage, I was uh, permitted to view this earth and what was going on here. There were no limitations to my vision, and I was astonished at this. I saw my wife and children at home. I saw President Heber J. Grant at the head of the great church and kingdom of God. 
and felt the divine power that radiated from God, giving the church light and truth, guiding its destiny. I beheld this nation found as, as it is upon correct principles, and designed to endure and be set by evil and sinister forces that seek to lead men astray and thwart the purposes of God. I saw towns and cities, the sin and wickedness of men and women. I saw vessels settling upon the ocean and scanned the battle-scarred fields of France and Belgium. I saw the whole world as if it were a panorama passing before my eyes. Then there came to me the unmistakable impression that this earth and persons upon it are open to the visions of the Spirit only when special permit, permission is granted or when they are assigned to special service. It's not like they stand there and gawk at us 24 hours a day. There's other things to be done. And uh, you'll note that there's authority there that directs who and when spirits are allowed permission to see through the veil. This is particularly true of the righteous who are busily engaged in the service of the Lord and cannot be engaged in two fields of activity at the same time. The wicked and unrepentant spirits still having their free agency and applying themselves in no useful or wholesome undertaking seek pleasure about their old haunts to the extent they are still tools of Satan. It is idle, mischievous, and deceptive spirits who appear as miserable counterfeits at spiritualistic scenes, table dancing, and other such things. The noble and great men and women do not respond at the call of the mediums, and every curious group of meddlesome inquirers. They would not do do it in mortality, and they certainly do not do it in their increased state of knowledge in the world of immortality. The wicked and unrepentant spirits are allies of Satan and his hosts, operating through willing mediums in the flesh. These three forces constitute an unholy trinity upon the earth and all are responsible for wickedness among men and nations. The next one is by Dr. John Lerma, Into the Light. Again, he's the hospice doctor in Houston. Now retired, I'm certain of it. A couple of pages here. Um, one of his patients is, uh, I, I believe I'm going to say this right, is Jean-Pierre. He was a 67-year-old anthropologist anthropological pathologist and an agnostic. Okay? And he comes to Dr. Lerma to be assisted in his death and has an out-of-body experience. And this is part of what he shares. He meets a man who introduces himself as Michael. And that's where we jump in here. Dr. Jean-Pierre said that Michael sensed his deep sadness and decided to move to the next lesson six billion years later. He has seen uh, part of the creation process. 
I found myself back on Earth next to a cellular structure I had once seen under the microscope during my early years in college, Dr. Pierre said. He described the cell as being surrounded by the virginal clear blue waters of the planet left by the melted ice from millions of asteroids and comets. Angels were flying around the planet appearing to be guarding God's plan. Now this is an agnostic saying this. Dr. Jean-Pierre then saw the explosion of life spanning millions of years. He saw nature's first multicellular organisms multiplying and then dying. Moving faster than the speed of light, he saw an awesome and frightening sight. Several mass extin extinctions that would appear to decimate nearly every species on this planet. The clear blue oceans were then dark and empty. He saw that he said that Michael comforted him by explaining that God's plan, seemingly violent at times, was perfect and best explained through the theory of relativity. Einstein, almost four billion years later, explained that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It only changes form. In other words, the doctor said, told me, that because God's plan included love and free will, he thought it would first be introduced by endowing it to the first particles the atom and its counterparts. From the very beginning, the atom carried God's immense love and energy needed to explore and love his creation. Thus, the atom induced mass extinctions were really energies changing form to develop a viable environment for man. Dr. Jean-Pierre said, slowly I saw the plants begin to evolve, then insects, only to be lost in the second great mass extinction upon the earth. After that extinction, reptiles were formed, implement of the sea, independent of the sea again only to die off. The dinosaurs came into life with flowering plants and the first fish and birds. Their decimation again was required to achieve God's loving plan. The time not now was about 100 to 200,000 years BC. I was told that this was when the first homo, homo sapiens appeared. The stage had been set. The necessary climate, water, land, plants, trees, and minerals were in place to allow man to live and to create. From cave paintings to the pyramids of Giza to Jesus Christ, Mohammed, Buddha, Da Vinci, Galileo, Columbus, Apollo 11, and now a space station, I was shown the natural world as it unfolded. And I might add, uh, those of you who have read the lecture, listened to the lectures on the plan, this follows lockstep with it. As Michael showed me present day Earth, I thought about how it took more than four billion years to create six billion souls, and all from that single cell. Dr. Jean-Pierre was told that man could possibly pass 
as those before us did, into oblivion, into the sixth extinction that he, as a scientist, knew was already in progress. Dr. Lerma, I was reassured that God's plan was unfolding in perfection because it was created out of the greatest ingredient, unconditional love. I was confused about this statement, so I asked Michael how this could occur if man was destroying the environment and each other. I was told that God knew this would occur and was deeply saddened by it. However, he knew this was part of the evolution of free will. When God engineered the planet, he secured its existence through self-protective mechanisms, including tsunamis, hurricanes, volcanoes, and climate changes. Dr. Jean-Pierre explained that God wants man to always have access to the planet, so as to learn valuable lessons via the human body. He said that the body was engineered to house our soul, to give us the necessary experiences, knowledge, and wisdom to seek and return to God in the hereafter. That is why securing the planet's existence is crucial. Very interesting insights about our Earth. Okay, the last one in this segment is uh, Beyond the Light. <clears throat> by PMH uh, Atwater, and this comes from uh, one, uh, some, her commentary as a result of her interviews and her uh, extensive, extensive research. Keep in mind, I'm on page 70, keep in, my, in mind what happened to Berkeley Carter Mills as you consider the case of Mellon Thomas Benedict. For many years, an accomplished lighting cameraman for feature films on location outside of Hollywood, Benedict had racked up a lifetime of major events before he was 30. What may have been a near-death experience occurred several weeks after Benedict's birth when it was discovered that his bowels were ruptured. His body was tossed to one side as a corpse. Yet much to everyone's surprise, he later revived. As soon as he was big enough to grab hold of crayons, he started what became a compulsive urge to create symbolic renditions of the black and white, yin and yang, circles of Eastern religious thought. He has no memory of why he drew those particular symbols. He spent his grade school years in a Catholic boarding school in Vermont and was baptized in the Salvation Army religion as a youngster. He traveled extensively because of a military stepfather until the family final finally settled down in Fayetteville, North Carolina. In 1982, Bennett was diagnosed as having inoperable cancer. He had retired from the frenzy of filmdom by then and was operating his own stained glass studio. As his conditions worsened, he spent more and more time with his art. One morning he awakened knowing he would die the next day, and he did. As the typical heaven-like scen uh, scenario began to unfold, Benedict recognized what was happening as it was happening. The process was familiar to him because he had read many books about the near-death phenomenon previously. Just as he, 
reached the light at the end of the tunnel, he shouted, Stop a minute! This is my death, and I want to think about this. By consciously intervening, Benedict willfully changed his near-death scenario into an exploration of realms beyond imagining and a complete overview of history from the Big Bang to 400 years into the future. Instantly he was pulled by light away from the tunnel, far away from Earth, past stars and galaxies, past Im imaginary and physical realities to a multi-angled overview of all worlds and all creation and past even that to the edge of existence where vibrations cease. He saw all wars from their beginnings, race as personality clusters, species operating like cells in a greater whole. By merging into the matrix of his soul, he confronted the no thing from which all things emerge. Benedict saw planetary energy systems in detail and how human thoughts influence these systems in a semi in, in a simultaneous interplay between past, present, and future. He learned that the Earth is a great cosmic being. Benedict was aware of walking back into his body after deciding to return from his journey as near as anyone can determine his experience took about 90 minutes. His doctor's assessment, though, was the most shocking. The cancer he had, had once had completely vanished. He's the one. I'm going to read that again. The earth is a great cosmic being. It has a spirit. It responds positive and negative to what we do on its surface. And we'll get more into that in the, the other lectures.